Thank you, Courtney, for your kind words. And uh, I'll get started. Uh, the What I'm going to cover is a lot of material. And in 30 minutes, I obviously can't do it justice. So if it looks disjointed and choppy, it's because of time sequence. And uh, we can chat after it. Uh, uh, anytime next week, anytime you want, if you have questions. So what I want to look at and talk to you about uh, that uh, uh, is what is going on in the field, not all of it, obviously, what should be done, which is the overdue, our part of the R&D Obviously, the D part has to follow the R part, and uh, it often doesn't, and it's something I will indicate. So let me start, and uh, essentially, what I am after, and a number of my colleagues, is to produce a overall, what we're calling a system of system, SOS, it's not a call for help, although it should be. <laughs> and uh, so everything in the pot that makes a flight vehicle and stir it. There are reasons for it because it is a system. And uh, you can't just uh, play around with one variable at a time and optimize it. Uh, back in the 1940s, when I was an undergraduate, uh, middle 40s and late 40s, the, uh, this cartoon appeared in one of the publications, and it's still timely. There are a lot of these groups in, in industry that consider themselves as entities onto themselves and do things and then come together. And it's really up to the chief engineer to ride herd on them that they that the whole system be integrated. So that that's what we mean by systems of systems. And uh, each one of these little cartoons is a system, and you want to look at it as a whole. So uh, what it leads to, obviously, is many partial differential and integral differential equations because there are many, many state variables. I haven't counted them. Uh, I just did a rough estimate you're going to see on the structural part and it's staggering. So when we look at the uh, flight vehicle SOS performance, these are some of the players that enter into it. Obviously, the aerodynamics, uh, and that doesn't mean you start there, but uh, it leads to the structure and the power, power plant and so on. And uh, then you run into problems with material failures, with buckling, and et cetera, and flutter and things of that nature, which in the end, give you the limiting variables, which is the last box. But of course, in the meantime, there's a closed loop and this feeds itself back and forth. So if we just look at the structural part of the vehicle, this is a rough estimate I made. Don't hold me to the numbers, but relatively the sizes are in proportion. So when you're looking at UAVs, and micro AVs, then you've got relatively few, and these are just the structural parameters, as I said. You can do them on a laptop. When you look at a small general aviation plane, you, you're talking about a high performance mainframe. And when you're looking at a big airplane like 787 or the Airbus A50, then look at the number of uh, 
parts that you have to deal with. The, uh, so what's involved, and I won't go into details, but just for the structure alone, these are the problems that we're facing. And uh, the biggest worry, of course, is the wing and that undergoes bending and shear and the, the uh, bending and shear both produce changes in the angle of attack because they change the incident wing wind and that's where the coupling starts. So then we got another problem and that's modeling. Uh, I present you here with three quotes and they're very apropos to modeling. In other words, just because we have a model, it's not the real thing. And that's what Korzybski meant by a map is not the territory. It's useful, but it's not the end of what's going on. Uh, Heisenberg, the uncertainty principle guy, is very uh, true with his statement. In other words, we look at nature and what we see is what we believe and that may not be the real thing. And finally, Nietzsche, uh, who preceded them all, although the book that I'm quoting here is much later than any of the other two, uh, says this, basically the same thing. And that is we, see what we want to see and what we can use, which is not necessarily the real thing. So when you look at a model that we're using, you first of all have the physical world and that's the real thing. And if you could model that, fine, you probably couldn't solve the problem right away, but the mathematics are very good. They're rigorous, but they're abstract. And then what we wind up with is the ad hoc model, which is basically magic and uh, far from reality. And there, this quote, I haven't been able to chase it down the last one. And that is models have their limitations, but stupidity in model generation does not. In other words, this really sums up what I've been saying. So if you look at the real world in more detail, this is a summary of what's going on. And this talk is being recorded. So you can look at it at any time and uh, review it if you're interested. And uh, in, the, in the final analysis, we use equations that we feel comfortable in solving. And one of the huge problems is, at least in uh, material properties, et cetera, is uh, the same thing with the flight loads, is that we don't have adequate experimental data and instructions. It's particularly noticeable in the sense that we barely have some scratching of uh, 1D properties, but nothing in multi-D or 2D even or 3D. But this is a huge problem as you well know. So uh, if you look at the parameters that are involved, and I'm still talking structures there, uh, which of course are influenced by the other pieces, this is what we're facing. And uh, the parameters are essentially the players, the global variables. And from that come the state variables. And I have not listed them all, obviously. And then the critical velocity, and I'll show you a computation soon which is a disaster because it's a very bad design. Uh, now, one of the big problems that we're facing is that people idealize the starting loading. And 
put in what we call heavy side function, which is the green broken line, both for the start and the finish. And uh, this takes infinite accelerations and decelerations. Hello, where are you gonna get the energy? Uh, so what we should have is an envelope of the red and green solid and then the black broken line for unloading. And that's the realistic loading. That one we can capture. Uh, here is a example of a loading of a bar was hit by a hammer and accelerometers at two locations, the blue one and the red one. And you can see in a very short time as things travel, the buildup of the displacement, in this case, acceleration is not instantaneous and the deceleration is the same way. And, you know, this happening, those times are real. We're looking here at milliseconds. So if you use a heavy side function, this is the relative error. And the T1 is deceptive because it could be seconds, it could be hours, could even be centuries. So the other problem is temperature when you start talking viscoelastic materials and the loading intercepts the modulus curves at different places. And uh, whereas it should intercept before T zero and uh, you get different answers for different temperatures and they're not correct. So uh, let me talk a little bit just to give you an idea what viscoelastic materials compromise. And you can see the first lines, the two blue ones, pretty much is what we deal with. And there are other things there, but you know, the whole menu takes in food, biological materials, uh, our skin, our blood, perfectly good viscoelastic materials. And what's characteristic of the viscoelastic material that unlike the elastic relation, you now have an integral relation because time is involved. And the linear modulus, and I haven't started talking about nonlinear yet, looks something like this function it starts out elastically and winds up with a relaxed, what we call a relaxed position here where there are no further changes in the modulus, but time of course is running. Now, that said, we have the problem of highly scattered properties. In elastic materials, we learned how to manufacture within plus or minus 3% as far as the modulus is concerned. On the other hand, for a real material that my colleagues down at Mississippi State tested, standard test, one dimensional, and look at the dispersion statistically, each one of those is one experiment of the same material, but it's a virgin cut from a block. Those are tension specimens. And uh, you got this huge change. And of course, there's a probability distribution across here. One of the things that they captured quite by accident is, and it's blown up here in this region. This is the lowest value that was captured. And as time goes on, it winds up the maximum. Now that's not unusual, but that's an extreme case. And that gives you an idea of what you're facing in terms of probability. And 
we can characterize the modulus as a deterministic function, which you see here, and a uh, <coughs> probability, probability density function multiplying. This is the only way to do it, but it's the simplest one. And here is the 3D plot of what goes on with the modulus in terms of the time sequence. And uh, this is one example. Don't take it as, as the last word. Uh, you run another material under, under different temperatures, for instance, and you're going to get a different picture. So the other problem is failures. Now, we tend in deterministic calculations to worry about the margin of safety. And if you go to probability analysis, uh, depending on the character of the dispersion of the material properties, you can get the same uh, for a given margin of safety. You can get multiple values quite different for the probability of failure. This is a large scale down here. These aren't obviously the real numbers. And that's, so basically you have to give up margin of safety when you talk probability of failure. Uh, the kinds of failure that you can encounter is here's the failure envelope. You have a column, you have bending, and you have relaxation. Now it looks like this curve is getting away from the red one. Not so, look at the scale over here. They're going to meet somewhere out here. So failure is inevitable if you wait long enough. But it may be 100 years. That's good or bad. Now, here is uh, a schematic of what happens to bending and torsion and uh, flutter and, uh, and material failure, which is ultimately the, uh, the failure in any uh, structure. Uh, the other things are the causes. And you can see in this example, the bending amplitude is what causes the failure first. But of course, these two are coupled and it could be the other way around. This is just a example. And uh, I don't want to shock you with too many equations, but the best way is a modification of the Shanley Ryder failure criteria, which was published in 1936 and has been the industry standard for deterministic uh, uh, deterministic uh, failures. Uh, the characteristic of what you want to watch, this is just a modified, expanded with many, as many as you want. You don't need to go to infinity. Uh, open parameters, but what you want to look at are these two guys, the allowable, the failure, and the applied. And they look something like this. And uh, over here, the blue uh, is less than the red line, you're okay. And then starting here, you're gonna experience failures. Well, it's not as simple as that. It's a miserable equation that gives you the probability of failure. And uh, nothing comes easy, as you know. Uh, some references. Now, the other thing that I want to point out is when we talk about invariants, those are the invariants of the stress vector. In the case of the Shandley Rider, you've got 27 possibilities because it's all based on one dimensional uniaxial stuff, whereas you get basically 28 equations to worry about here, or if you put it all together, 
28 variables, whereas with the invariants, you get only four. So this is a preferable way to go. Now, a rough estimate on a large airplane is number of parts staggering. And the uh, number of parameters that you can have are 18, you know, mod modulus, moment of inertia, and so on. So you take 18 to the times 10 to the ninth, that's a lot of computations. That's why you got a lot of engineers in industry. Now, let's, let me show you a few results, what I refer to. Don't pay too much attention to these, but these are combinations that are possible. Bending torsion, uh, and it's a problem where you have a rotational velocity of the vehicle, in other words, a roll, and that's what the P is, the velocity, and uh, I won't go into the other details, but what makes it a bad design, uh, these are the design values essentially for these cases. And you notice they vary from almost 300 down to 21. They should all be equal if you have an ideal design. That means you've got work to do to improve on this design. Now, we have very little failure of data. And one of the things we know uh, peripherally is that moisture, which is this M here, uh, has a very large influence on what's going on, both the modulus and the uh, <clears throat> the uh, failure criteria. And this is nothing but the Shanley Ryder thing. So down here, a lot of time and various values. Now, composites, as you know, are things which have unequal moduli in tension and in compression. So you have another diagram for compression. The failure envelope is, in terms of the invariance, is nice drawing, nice artistic drawing, but you got to do one of these for each time. So what you're looking for is something which I wasn't aware of until four years ago, one of our graduates from the 1960s, Al Inselberg, devised this parallel coordinate system. And uh, what you see is a conglomerate of all the pieces, very confusing, takes time to learn. And this is the diagram. Here are the various players. There are 16 coordinates on here try to make a 3D diagram in 16 dimensions, and you see it's impossible. And each line can be followed, because you can follow them one at a time if you want. But I can't go into details. It would take more than an hour, uh, obviously. But if you're interested, look at Inselberg's book. It's really a revelation of what can be done. And then on top of that, you got the possibility of chaos. And uh, that is something that Lorenz discovered by accident. He was, is a, a, was a uh, meteorologist, and he was twiddling the uh, equations for weather predictions. And quite accidentally, this is back in, this, in the 60s, early 60s, he decided to cut off one of the parameters, which was with four decimal places to two, and then he went out to lunch while the computer was running. And this was no laptop that was doing this in the 60s. So 
he comes back after lunch, and lo and behold, he sees the results of chaos. You can get what we call bifurcation, where the solution, first of all, divides in two, and then keeps dividing, as you can see here. Now, that's an indication that something is going wrong, because physically, you don't get this jumping around and get two solutions. Another view, not of this, but a possibility of chaos, are these orbits. You start over here, you go into this thing, sorry, uh, and it gets over here and then goes around and it comes back and this goes back and forth. Now, this is a stable thing if these orbits don't grow in magnitude. And that we have no way of knowing what functions can be chaotic or how to find the parameters for a function that is periodic. For instance, we still don't know after 50 years, uh, and when you look at Lorenz's equation, whether or not the answers that he found are all the answers there are, or whether there are other possibilities of chaos. So I'm coming to the end, and I'm sure you're breathing a sigh of relief. Uh, I'm just hitting some of the highlights that uh, what happens. But there's a curious effect in viscoelastic beams, and that is when the moduli are unequal, the uh, neutral axis, which we are so used to corresponding to the geometry, starts moving around. And so does the shear center. And that constitutes a moving boundary problem because you don't know where they are and you have to find them. So what do we need to do? This isn't the whole picture, but this is the critical issues. And that is uh, find more system of system studies and above all number two is get experimental data because we're modeling in the dark with, without any data that's multi-D and uh, we really don't know what we're doing. And obviously I have to test the airplane. The good thing is that when you do the static and the dynamic test on a full airplane, as you well know, you generally come very close to 100% to, of the predicted failure structurally. And some of it is below, plus or minus. And that's amazing. But, you know, a, a good design is plus or minus 2 or 3% from what the predictions are. So uh, I just want to leave you with the idea that uh, with dealing with a system of system, and you have to look at the whole thing and not just that it's part separately. Uh, and the final conclusion is that probability is, uh, analysis is best applied to missiles because they one flight deals with a predict predicted time of flight and we know uh, what we can tolerate with the probability of failure. And of course, the lower the probability of failure, which is what you want, you're never going to get zero, practically. But you know, you want it lower. You have to realize it takes more structure, which takes more weight. And uh, therefore, you may have a heavier airplane and you have to do something. So uh, with that, I, led, and I thank you for your attention. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, put them on the chat, because my hearing stinks, and uh, I'll answer them. 
And if not directly, I'll send you an email. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've either put you asleep or you're stunned. Thank you, Uncle Harry. A cartoon is one of my little jokes. <laughs> Thanks, Rag. And you too, Martin. All right, so as Harry said, if you have questions for him, go ahead and put those in the chat box. He'll be able to uh, read them there. If not, um, thanks for joining us today, everyone. We will hang on uh, for a little while to see if uh, some questions do pop up for us. Um, if not, be checking your email for our next uh, Take a Break with AE. That should be at the end of May. Great. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jim. <laughs>